Hey everyone, I'm excited for this video today. Today we're going to be talking about Hypnosis Songs Fund, um, a business that es essentially uh, entirely operates in the music royalty space. It's a really interesting, new, innovative um, space in public security uh, that we'll get through more throughout this presentation. If you're interested in this type of content, please uh, hit the subscribe button, follow along with the channel, would love to hear if you have any thoughts or you know anything about hypnosis that I don't share in today's video. Leave it below in the comments. And if you want to support the video and this content, also hit the like button. It would help me out a lot. So without further ado, we'll jump into this one. So for those of you who don't know, every song essentially is its own business. And all the different um, distributions of music, whether that's um, something conventional like Spotify, Apple Music, uh, or something that you may not think about as much uh, like Peloton and, and TikTok where it's more background noise and supportive entertainment. All of these different brands and, and, and forms of using music um, have to pay the unit holders and the, the owners of the song. Um, so Hypnosis, the example we'll be talking about today, owns a collection of very popular songs that, that we've all heard of. Um, and essentially, as people um, either perform those songs live, uh, use those songs uh, as a direct form of entertainment through playing them on Spotify, YouTube, whatever it may be, or you're hearing them in a commercial, you're hearing them in a game, um, whatever it may be, they have those as profit centers that they then derive royalty income from and pay those incomes out to their shareholders. So before we get deeper into the video, just a very quick overview of Hypnosis's business. They own about 150 different catalogs of music. Um, a catalog is, is kind of subjective. It could be um, a songwriter, everything that a songwriter's written in their life across many different musicians and artists could be one catalog, um, or it could just be one band's catalog. So I don't really think that says too much in isolation, um, but they own rights to a portion of 65,000 songs and lots of their songs um, are very high profile songs. So 150 Grammy winning songs, uh, 15,000 give or tape songs that have been in the top 10 on the global charts, so on and so forth. So you kind of get the gist here and we'll get more into the exact type of music that they, um, that they own in, in the coming slides. But before getting into that, I just want to take a step back away from the company and look at the space that we're operating in. So going back to 1999, you can kind of see the entire market in billions. So that's about $25 billion of record sales were done entirely in physical, um, entirely in physical albums and CDs that people go out and buy. And you can kind of see over the last 20 years, believe it or not, um, from 1999, almost entirely to 2014, there was secular decline in this category as lots of people were downloading music illegally. Um, it was very hard to monetize uh, music usage and the owners of the songs, whether that be the writers, the performers, etc., were really getting cut out of the equation. Um, with the emergence of, of better technology and bringing music directly to consumers uh, through platforms like Spotify and so on. Um, they've been able to re-monetize this category and you're seeing sequential growth year over year since 2014. This number has exploded in the past five years as well. So this is a, an old chart, um, but I think you're probably close to the all time highs in the early 2000s. And you can kind of see it's no longer physical um, sales really leading the way. It's the expansion of streaming through Spotify, Apple Music, etc. So you can kind of see streaming very small in 2014. Looks like it's doubling every year from 2014 to 2017. And that strong growth obviously has continued over the past five years. So it would be great to have an updated chart, but you kind of see what I, where, where we're going with this. This category is getting re-monetized in a big way and it's bringing music to more people in in um, the United States, but also globally uh, to enjoy and, and, and to pay on a monthly basis through platforms like Spotify and stuff like that. So let's talk about hypnosis specifically. 
you can find this on their website if you're interested in any one of their ownerships in, in these lists. You can click on and, and kind of learn more. But this is them at the end of the day just saying they own a lot of songs and they own a lot of very popular songs in culture and in society today. So they own about, whatever, 25% that are of the songs that have hit over a billion views on Spotify or listens on Spotify. Um, 52 of the greatest 500 songs of all time, um, 13, almost 50% of the top 30 listen to music videos on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So they're owning very popular music. We'll get through some of the artists uh, next. Um, as we look at, I, I couldn't take a screenshot of all 83 just because they own so many damn songs, but I kind of just did the, the top eight and then the last eight to hit a billion. So you get a sense, Ed Sheeran, Sean Mendez, um, Lady Gaga, Dua Lipa, uh, Skrillex, Adele, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Maroon 5, 50 Cent. Not going to bore you guys with going through names all day, but it's really like A-list talent, A-list songs that they've bought the rights for that they believe will have a long run rate in society and in culture that they'll continue to collect those royalties for decades and decades of time. Just going through, giving you, filling out the, the feel of the types of songs they own. Um, so these are songs and albums like MC Hammer, You Can't Touch This, very popular song, a more recent song um, by Nicki Minaj, kind of a, a playoff of an old song that I also think they have ownership in as well. So therefore, I think they got a piece of the new one. Um, bon Jovi, they made a deal for a lot of Bon Jovi songs, Journey songs. Um, so you're kind of getting the sense that they, they do have a lot of older songs as well, but they do have new songs and they're playing there. Um, so they're really diversified across age as well as space of music, whether that's rock, pop, etc. Here are some of the artists that they have rights to at least portions of their music. So uh, Neil Young was a huge catalog that they bought earlier this year. Uh, we talked 50 Cent. Uh, Nelly, Pusha T, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Shakira, um, Skrillex, uh, Benny Blanco has written songs for all kinds of A-list musicians over his career. So those are some songwriter rights that they have um, in terms of the royalties that, that he was owed. Um, and it really just goes on and on. One more recent one uh, that came up in the news was they just bought Justin Bieber's entire um, back catalog of, of his career to date for about $200 million. Um, I don't believe it's been released what um, yield in terms of annual royalties that that catalog is is getting. Um, I'd probably assume it's something high single digits. So maybe um, like a million dollars a month in royalties that they'll be receiving for, for that investment. Um, but that's just speculative. Uh, and then you kind of see some of the other acquisitions. I talked about the Neil Young one, um, but that was a huge acquisition that they did, cost a lot of money. Um, and then for 75% in 300 songs um, from uh, The Dream that he had some rights to, um, they paid another $23 million. So think songs like Single Ladies, Umbrella, Baby, Mariah Carey's Touch My Body, et cetera, et cetera. So these are very popular songs that lots of people have probably heard of. I think what's worth noting is all rights and all songs are not created equal. So they say they have rights in 65,000 songs. Some of these songs, they may own a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of 1% of the royalty rights. And then there's other songs that they may be owning like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% of the royalty rights of the song. So when you see big names like um, Beyonce, Single Ladies, they may be deriving a lot less income from that song if they own like 0.1% of the rights as they do for other songs that they own 30 or 40% of. And unfortunately, there's just not a clean way to understand this from bird's eyes view looking at the company, given how many times the, like the unit holder split of, of song rights gets gets split up throughout um, the lifespan of these companies and some people sell a portion of their rights not other portions different um, songs have different rights to start with 
some have music agencies involved. So just super complicated. Um, so when you see stuff like that, uh, you may not be making a ton of money from each one of these plays necessarily. And it may even be a smaller part of the business than a song that you've never heard of just because of the percent own right. So um, just proceed with caution when you see something like they own a Beyonce song or whatever it may be. Um, it, it may be a very, very minor part of the pie. This is really a play on the broader music royalty space, owning 65,000 songs, than owning exposure to one artist in particular. So I wouldn't jump into any particular royalty fund based off of a single artist or a single song that they own necessarily. Okay, going into some of their segment splits a bit. So we'll start on the left-hand side. You can kind of see pop and rock are two of the biggest segments that they currently own. Um, I think they have been trying to grow other segments that perform really well on streaming. Um, so I think they're trying to grow um, some some rap as well as more like EDM type, type music uh, as well as those really perform well on, on lots of streaming services, it seems. And that's really where they're focused on uh, in terms of how much money and how much share they're getting on, on Spotify every month so they can get lots of the payout that, that they're paying out to their um, music providers. So overall, I'd say good to see that they're pretty broadly diversified. Would love for them to be even more diversified with over one third of their business in, in rock, another 30% in pop. So 70% in two genres is, is a lot, but I think that's something that they're probably working on as well. On the right hand side, what's really interesting is you can kind of see they're really skewed more towards older music uh, in terms of um, in, in terms of just like their asset value. Ninety five percent, ninety five to ninety seven percent is three years or older, and over fifty percent is ten years or older. And I think I've heard their CEO talk about this, and the main rationale is. After time has gone by, you get a better sense of the long-term rate of royalties that a song will provide. So in the first three years, definitely in the first year, you're essentially gambling uh, on how much traction and how sticky a song is going to be. But after five, six years, you get a better sense of what the next five years will look like. So that's where they're focused on most of their business, um, you know. You can take that as a pro or a con. One of the things that I get worried about is um, as songs obviously get older and older, they don't get played as frequently. There's constantly new music coming out. Um, cultures are changing. Tastes are changing. Music's changing. So what is the value of, of half the portfolio going to be even 10 years from now? Now, they talk about music being timeless and especially the the quality of, of, of uh, songs that they're purchasing. But that is a, a bit of a concern for me if I was to consider an investment in a business like this. This is interesting as well. So you can kind of see over time, um, zero to three years used to be 13 to 14%, then went down to 9%, and now is under 3%. So as they continue to expand and buy new catalogs, they're really not touching new stuff. Um, so I say that, I get, I get why the rationale of, of being safe and, and making sure you're not buying something that's going to decelerate very quickly. Um, but my last point still remains where it kind of concerns me a bit on, are we over-invested in 10 plus old songs at over 60% of your business that may or may not be going into extinction in, in terms of popularity and, and frequency of play. Okay, so... Took a long time to do that business and category review, but we're on to the stock here. The stock uh, launched in, I think, 2018-ish for just over 100 bucks, $105, and it was pretty stable, trading almost bond-like, paying about a 5% dividend, um, and that dividend's obviously just the royalties coming in. Um, during COVID, it dipped initially, like everything did, down to... $95, still pretty stable. And then we realized that um, lots of people are on TikTok, huge new revenue stream. Lots of people are on Peloton, another new revenue stream. Um, lots of people are on Spotify and everything else more than before. 
all those uh, businesses, whether it was gaming, Spotify, Apple Music exploded, and the usage of music exploded, even though live events kind of went to zero. So the business took off, grew 30% in terms of stock price, stayed there for most of COVID, and then very recently has been plummeting, and it's been plummeting because of higher interest rates. So obviously, this is a very simple business. You're paying for current values um, or a net present value of a future earnings. So when you're talking a, a 3x rise in interest rates, that's obviously going to impact the future, the value of the future cash flows. And that's exactly what's happening here. Another aspect is they do carry a bit of debt to buy new um, catalogs. So obviously the cost of service that debt operationally has also gone up, which doesn't help. But where the company's trading today is about $85 on the London Stock Exchange. Not dollars, sorry, but 85 whatever the currency would be uh, in the great British pounds. Um, and that's deriving about a 6.2% yield. So you can get a pretty healthy yield here if it's a company and a business you're interested in um, today. Going over their business a bit. So a couple, couple things just to talk here. Once again, they're highlighting um, the diverseness of, of their business and their, their ownership. They also call out a couple new songs. I guess they increased their ownership or gained ownership one. Um, Nicki Minaj new song was the number one U.S. single, top five in the U.K. and the rest of the world. So they're just highlighting some of their wins in terms of what they own. Um, but overall, uh, one of the main things that, that they talk about on their call is just uh, a new ruling that's increasing the songwriter's percentage ownership in future royalties. Um, and they tend to own lots of the songwriter portions of royalty splits for songs so this will directly help their business and help how much of songs that they're getting um royalties for which is why they're highlighting it it'll be a bit of a tailwind for, for their business into the future um in terms of some of those stats again and we won't belabor it because we went into it a lot earlier um but you can kind of just see them bragging about uh some key areas where they have a lot of exposure in terms of their ownership of songs once again like i i don't know how to take this just because like i said earlier are all 13 of these songs very minor ownership where it's like you own one one thousandth of the six cents you get every time it plays on spotify like i don't know and there's no way that they like break it out for all six thousand songs at least not that i know of so it's it's very hard for me to come away with this with any real opinion um, other than I get where they're playing and they're trying to like be perceived as a company that's playing on top quality songs. Um, in terms of growth, this is one that I think everyone invested in the space feels pretty um, promising on is new income streams. So they call out gaming, social media. I think in general, as more of the world turns online, um, there's going to be a lot more opportunities to monetize music just as a utility um, than there was before. And the recurring business models in place, um, whether that's like Peloton, we'll see if that's successful, um, but definitely like Spotify, Apple Music, where it's just like cash in their pockets every month. Um, and a portion of those revenues go straight to the song providers. So that's just a really attractive business model. And by owning the songs, you can think of it as a different way to play streaming, where you're in a much um, you're in a much less capital intensive side of the game, um, but still getting exposure to that streaming growth through the royalty that Spotify is paying you, and you're getting a six point two percent dividend to play the game. Whereas if you own Spotify or Peloton or something else, you have a lot of other business risk. You're not, it's not a pure play on, on streaming and recurring revenue. So that's one way to think about it, but, um, but definitely more involved than just that. Okay. In terms of the valuation. So apparently they're saying as of this was from December, their stock's worth about 150 bucks. 
And I think um, right now it said it was about $85. So they think they're extremely undervalued. Um, but this is a business that keeps selling new shares um, to fund more acquisitions, regardless of what the share price is. So I find that interesting. For the company setup, they're backed by Blackstone. So unfortunately, I feel like one of their priorities is growing the size of the fund, regardless of what that means for total return. Because Blackstone is, is definitely dishing out um, equity in, in this fund to private shareholders, and they're taking a management fee, and they're putting this in all the, the, these other funds that they own. So they want this fund to be super large, super big. Um, so even though they're saying their stock price is 50% too cheap, that didn't stop them from spending $200 million on Justin Bieber's uh, catalog and probably diluting shareholders farther at the cheaper price. So, uh, you know, I find that interesting. Overall, net debt at about 25%. So that's a pretty, for a business that should be just like cash in, cash out, they do hold a decent amount of debt and operating leverage. So as interest rates continue to rise, or if they do, not only is that revaluing the income streams that they've purchased, but it's also making them pay out more in interest expense. So a bit of a double hit. And then in terms of dividends, so they're paying about five and a quarter pounds per share, um, which was at 6.2%. Um, I think we're going to be talking about earnings per share in a couple slides. So I'll, I'll hold on my thoughts on that. Um, lots going on here, but at the end of the day, I just want to talk their revenue mix, which is essentially what this is, or income mix. So over 50% of their incomes from the US. I imagine that's just um, average revenue per user of like Apple Music and, and Spotify in the US is, is likely higher than lots of other areas in the world. Some other emerging technologies, like lots of the gaming companies that they probably have deals with um, have primarily US consumers, um, things like Peloton and stuff like that. TikTok's huge in the US, I know it's global, but um, maybe more monetized in the US, etc. So over 50% of this business um, is getting its revenue from the US. 20% Europe, 15% UK, 11% rest of the world. Okay, so decently diversified, um, but good to know that it's still a very big chunk coming from the US. So it, it's not necessarily um, underdeveloped by any means on US exposure. On this slide, I just want to show that not like streaming income is the biggest focus and the biggest growth area, um, but um, or one of the biggest growth areas, but it is not the only way they're deriving income from. So you have digital downloads, uh, performance income, synchronization income, producer royalties. I don't understand what all of this means, to be honest, but generally speaking, um, streaming income uh, is long term the biggest secular growth trend that this business has but there's a lot more to it in terms of live performances new channels for music etc um, that you have to keep in mind in terms of what you're buying exposure to when you're buying uh, song rights and, and royalty rights for songs okay so in terms of eps it looks like um they made about three bucks, three to four bucks in EPS in six months leading uh, to September 22. So if we're just going to assume that that's pretty constant and recurring, let's call it seven to eight dollars on the year. And they're paying out 525 or seven to eight pounds. They're paying out five and a half pounds in dividends. So they're left with a couple pounds a share um, to potentially pay down debt, um, buy back shares if they wanted to, but I don't think that's this company style, or do acquisitions. So you're getting a good dividend, but it's it's probably hampering their ability to operate overly freely, which is fine, depending on what you want to get out of this investment vehicle if you're considering buying it. Okay, so I just want to close on some of my final thoughts. The first one is... This company is traded on the London Stock Exchange. So investing in this company in the US or in Canada, you have some barriers. I've seen and talked to people who've done it, um, but it seems like it's a bit of a pain. So you, you better have to really want to do it. You're probably going to have a couple points of FX hurt 
you're going to have some complexities on taxes and, and stuff like that by owning a, a foreign entity like this and, and getting dividend income from it. So you have to be committed if you want to do this. And I don't recommend, you know, doing it and, and putting 500 bucks in it or something um, because it probably won't be worth um, the, the time and, and all the headache to do. So that, that's, that's the first thing and the first barrier. I think overall, um, while it's a juicy yield and, and it's an interesting space to have exposure to, I just get a bit concerned that they operate or they may operate more in, in silo. Um, whereas if you were a Warner music or a universal music group, you're more like partners with these artists on an ongoing basis. Um, and you kind of continue to have exposure to their new music and, and invest in them as artists versus just owning rights for them in one period of time. Um, so I feel like there may, they, they may be lacking a competitive advantage from not having that ongoing relationship with lots of these artists working on their next album and their future albums and really getting a sense of what's going on in that performer's lifespan. Um, so that's something that eeks me about, about this a bit. The other thing is just their overdevelopment on older music. So I just genuinely don't know, like 10 years from now, will people still be listening to any of these songs that they own from the nineties? Um, and even if they are, you'd have to think that the songs they own today are slowly becoming less and less popular. So you're getting the 6% yield, but in 10 years, the net asset value of what they own today is almost guaranteed to be less. So the only way to continue to create more value um, is to own newer music. And it's just, how are you going to do that? You're going to continue to dilute investors to buy new catalogs into perpetuity. Like, I just don't understand the 20-year glide path of how this will go up in net asset value with the exception of assuming streaming and monetization is just going to absolutely explode. And if that's your investment hypothesis and thesis, then I think investing directly into like a Spotify or something like that would get you more upside because you don't have the dilute element of being exposed specifically to older songs and needing to refresh and continue to buy um, newer songs. So that's my overall thought. If this was traded in the North American markets, I may be a bit more open to it, but there's enough red flags. Oh, the last one being, I don't love how it's tied into Blackstone, who tends to be um, incentivized to grow the assets under management versus grow the shareholder um, return. And we've seen that, like I mentioned, the Justin Bieber $200 million dilution um, a month after saying their stock's 50% undervalued. I feel like that happens more when you have a main shareholder that's mainly invested and, and focused on growing the asset under management versus shareholder return. So that's kind of another thing that, that irks me a bit about this one. So I won't be looking at how I can possibly invest in this company. I think it's an interesting investment vehicle. It's definitely unique. Uh, once again, if it was on the North American markets, I may be more tempted um, being a dividend and a yield investor. But this is one that um, I'll watch from the sidelines. It's it's cool. I hope something like this does come across in America. But for the time being, if I was to invest in music, it would probably be um, something more like a, a music agency like Warner Music or like Universal, which trades overseas as well. Um, because you do still get a good portion of their revenue and their profit is from music royalties, um, from publishing their, their musicians' albums. They do get a slice of it. Uh, but they have a lot of other things going on. And unlike a hypnosis who's very um, levered to past songs, they're continuing to refresh their exposure with new songs at no dilutive cost to their share price. So you are paying a higher multiple. I don't think this multiple is right, but I think they do about a billion in, in free cash flow. So you're paying high teens multiple on free cash flow um, versus you know a, a low teens on hypnosis. Um, but I think it's a bit more future proofed as a business, uh, in, in general. Um, so not interested in, in either one of these necessarily, but this is probably where I'd be more focused on if I did want exposure in the music royalty space. So that's all I got today. 
Um, would love to hear your thoughts if anyone's invested in the music space or if anyone has any other information on hypnosis that I may have missed or misunderstood. Um, but if not, thank you guys so much for joining and watching throughout the video to the very end. And if you haven't yet, please hit the like button and please consider subscribing to the channel. It would really mean a lot as we're looking to grow. See you guys in the next one.